<clears throat> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to yeah. gather in your name and to partake of praise and worship and fellowship and to just honor you with this moment of time, Father. And Father, today we want to remember that communion isn't just something that we do to say we've done it, Father, but it's about connection. It's about us taking a moment in the beginning of our week to connect to you. It's not a ritual that we perform, but it's about relationship. It's not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be a blessing. It's supposed to be a time where we remember and connect with you, Father, just like in our families where we have a family dinner or get together on the holidays or get together on someone's birthday. It's an opportunity to remember what you've done to gather together as family with you. Because you said when there are two or more gathered in your name, you are in our midst. So you are here with us. You're partaking of this with us just as the disciples had you there in the flesh. We have you here in the spirit. So by your spirit, Father, we pray over this bread. and pray that we remember what it represents. The cost that was paid for us. Not that we would be made perfect, but that we can be perfected. That we can continually submit ourselves to you, Father. And if we have mistakes and confess them, yes. that you'll cleanse us from them. That you'll give us the strength and the humility to forgive others of their mistakes against us. And that, Father, through that relationship, we have a blessed assurance. That if we continue to seek your kingdom and your righteousness, to, to, to live righteously before you, that you will take us, that you will receive us. That when you open that book of life, our names will be inscribed there. So, Father, thank you for this opportunity. Again, forgive us of our sins. And allow us to receive this bread with gratefulness and gladness. And let us eat it together in Jesus' name. For that Lord, and thank you also that you fill us. You fill us with love and understanding and wisdom, and not from ourselves, but from you. And through your spirit and through your promises and through our decision to believe them and to follow you, that we can receive all of that and more. And no matter how much we ask or what we're thinking about or asking for, You've already promised in Ephesians 3 that you can do more than that. You can do more than we can think, more than we can ask, more than we can imagine. So Lord, just help us today to remember who our God is, who we are praying to. No matter what we're praying about, let us remember who we are praying to. And even as we pray over this communion and over this juice, let us remember that it represents your blood that was poured out willingly. You weren't someone that was sacrificed for us. You allowed yourself to be sacrificed. You weren't forced into it. You chose and you accepted it. So Father, let us accept that gift. The gift of the blood that washes us from sin, that cleanses us from unrighteousness, and that seals us in a new and better covenant. So we drink this together in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 So, let's turn in our Bibles. Book of Colossians, chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Give me a moment to get there. Praise God. Colossians 4. 2 through 6. Ma, could you read that, please? <clears throat> Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about the, His mysterious plan, 
concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Corinne, do you have that in the Amplified? Colossians. Colossians 4. Mm -hmm. And 2 through 6. Could you read that, please? Mm -hmm. Be persistent and devoted to prayer, being alert and focused in your prayer life with an attitude of thanksgiving. At the same time, pray, pray for us too, that God will open a door of opportunity to us for the word to proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I have been imprisoned, that I may make it, make it clear and speak boldly and unfold the mystery in the way I should. Conduct yourself with wisdom in your interactions and outsiders Non-believers, make the most of each opportunity, treating it as something precious. Let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to answer each one who questions you. Amen. And the reason I had it read both ways is because normally we study in this church and in this family from NLT. But there's a specific word that God kept putting on my spirit, which is there in the Amplified. It's also in the King James, the New King James, many other translations. It's salt. My question to you today is, are you salty? Now, I know in today's society, and young people especially, there's an expression when you call someone salty. If you look it up in Urban Dictionary, it's about being angry, bitter. You know, are you salty when somebody beats you in the game, when somebody cuts you off, when somebody says the wrong thing? It's an expression that has a negative connotation. You know, you're not you're not having a righteous anger, but you feel you feel you feel cheated. You feel like someone did you wrong. But here, when God is asking us to be seasoned with salt, we have to ask ourselves, well, why is it important to be seasoned with salt? Well, it goes back to what it says in six: let your conversation be gracious and attractive. So that you will have the right response for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, m me and my family watch a lot of Gordon Ramsay. He's a, if you don't know, he's a, a world famous chef. Owns a lot of restaurants, has cooking shows, teaches. And one of the main things he looks for is proper seasoning. And he'll tell you right off the bat if it doesn't have enough salt. Mm -hmm. Because when something doesn't have enough salt, people who appreciate it know it right away. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between proper seasoned food and improperly seasoned food. That can make the total difference in taste. And, it, and now that's what it's about, mainly. But back in the day, salt was also used as a preservative. You know, you, you had salted meats because they didn't have refrigerators. You understand what I'm saying? So that's where, like ham, that whole thing with ham being so salty, because that was, the, that was the, the best way to take care of ham and and pork was to salt it, to preserve it. Not only did it kill bacteria, but it dried the meat out so there was no more moisture for more bacteria to come. It was a preservative. So it's not only about flavor, it's about preservative, but salt can also be used antiseptically. It's not very fun, it's painful, but if you got a wound and you got nothing else, salt will kill that bacteria and also draw out the moisture to prevent molds and funguses mm. from growing. But why is it important to have attractive conversations? It says, let your conversation be gracious, gracious and attractive. Why is that important? It's so that you will have the right response for everyone. We often don't think about our requirement, our expectation to be able to speak about our faith. You know, don't consider it as if you work in a store and a customer comes up to you and has a question about your store, your boss is going to expect you to be able to speak to that customer. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's, let's say, your area. Let's say you work in home section of a store. And you're in home, and the customer comes up to you, you should have a response about home. You should know what's going on. You should speak to the sales, speak to the quality of the merchandise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let's say you're walking through the store, and you happen to be in an area that's not yours. And somebody stops you and asks you, 
Me as a manager, I would expect my people to take them to someone who knows about that area. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to know everything in the Bible, but you have to know where to go to, Amen. who to take them to. So we're always expected to have the right response, whether it's sharing a, a testimony, sharing something that we've been through personally, whether it's sharing scriptures, whether it's taking them to a church service, whether it's taking them to someone that has a little more experience in that particular area. Someone you know who has gone through something. My wife has had a hysterectomy. I can't speak to that except from a husband's point of view. Mm -hmm. But if there's a woman that's going to go through that or has been through that and doesn't know what to deal with, how to feel, how to approach it, what, what medicines to take, how's it going to affect her body, let me, let me give you my wife's phone number. Let me give you her business card. She can speak to you about that. So in the same way, in our faith, if we've gone through something and our faith has been stretched because we've been sick, because our children have been sick, but we prayed and trusted God and God has delivered, then we should be able to speak to that. If, if, we, if we've read the scriptures and that scripture has come up and been verified in our lives, we should be able to speak to that. One of the other things that's so important for seasoning is it helps cover up unpleasant tastes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's true of the word. I don't know about for you, but in my walk to become the Christian man you see before me, and I'm still not perfect, but I'm striving, I'm pushing, I'm crawling sometimes. I know some of the word has been a little bitter, been a little hard to swallow. And that seasoning, the way it depends how it's given to me, makes it easier for me to swallow or not. If somebody comes at me and says, well, Ben, you know, let's talk. Let me, let me share with you why. And break down the word with me and be patient and kind with me. That tastes a lot better going down than someone beating me over the head with the Bible, telling me I'm a sinner, telling me if I don't get myself right, I'm going to go to hell. My family's going to suffer. I'm going to lose this. That may all be very true. But hearing it like that versus hearing it so that it's gracious mm -hmm. and attractive can make all the difference. Let's go on. Go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 9. 9, 49, and 50. Mark 9, 49 and 50. Dario, could you read that for me, please? For everyone will be tested with fire. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with each other. So here's a question. That Jesus, if you didn't know, this is Jesus talking. And he's preaching. And he's asking a question. If it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Well, that's not a thing. Not that I know of. And obviously Jesus didn't think it was a thing either because this question is really rhetorical. You can't. You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with each other. So speaking to your disciples, his disciples, he says, first... You gotta live with each other right. You have to have the qualities of salt. What do we talk about the qualities of salt? It's preservative. It prevents, it, it protects. It, it seasons things, makes them gracious, makes them go down a little easier, makes them flavorful. And also, salt is an essential nutrient for life. For a healthy life, we have to have a certain amount of salt in the diet. The problem is that we overdo it. And if you want to compare that to something, compare it to those people who do nothing but spout scripture. Nothing but act holier than thou. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those people who are so pious and so falsely righteous that it makes you sick. Mm -hmm. Those people who twist scripture mm -hmm. to suit them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With the right amount of salt, your life will be balanced. Mm -hmm. It helps balance the amount of nutrients, the amount of fluids in your body. Mm -hmm. All these things, but when you overdo it, it can make you sick. It can lead to high blood pressure and other problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're 
called to be salty. It's just how what kind of salty are you being? Now, again, he says, well, how do you make it salty again? The other part of that, thinking about it, well, if it's not salty, if, it's, if it loses its abilities, loses its ability to season, to flavor, what do you do with it? Well, let's go to Mark 9, 42 through 50. Let's back up a little bit. So at 42, Ben, could you read that, please? But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. You can keep going all the way through 48, please. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. For the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. And that's when 49 comes in, for everyone will be tested with fire. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty? Again? So again, there's this testing. Are you being salty? Are you right with God? Are you answering for your hope? Are you answering for your feelings in God, your love for God, your connection to God? Are you really giving an answer? Is that answer, first and foremost, is it real in your life? Because if you don't apply it to your life, then what does it matter? You preaching to others and not applying it to your life makes you what? A hypocrite. And that's one thing Jesus couldn't stand. A play actor. That's what hypocrites were. They were performing the hippodrome. They were actors. People who'd put on a show in front of others. But that's not who they really were. Especially back in the day when men dressed up as women because women weren't allowed to act. So don't be a hypocrite. It's better, he says, it's better for you to be uh, hot or cold rather than be lukewarm. That middle ground, trying to walk between both worlds. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. But we want to be both. Amen. We want a little bit of God, especially when it comes to, oh, help me on my job, help me with my finances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we want to be of the world when it comes to connecting to friends. Yeah. And watching things we know we shouldn't watch. Drinking things we know we shouldn't drink. Going places we know we shouldn't go. Yeah. Well, God is with me. Or we don't even think about God in those instances. Mm -hmm. I don't know how some people justify it. And then, you know, I've seen some things, people, family, brothers and sisters. I've seen some things that people who call themselves Christians do that makes my mind swim. Mm, preach. I just can't believe that these people in the name of God or in the name of holiness say that it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's all right. God is okay with this. But clearly, in the Bible that I read, and no matter what translation you read it, he's not okay mm -hmm. with these things. And I'm not going to get into every single thing people do wrong. It's clearly there defined. If you want to go, go to the fruit of the Spirit, back up a few verses. It talks about the things he doesn't like, mm -hmm. things he doesn't approve of, the attitudes. Let's continue. Let's go to Luke 14. Luke 14, 25 through 35. You know, the Bible's full of wonderful parables. You know, that he used for his time. That they still apply, but we might not get them all because we, we're not farmers. We don't deal with livestock. We don't have a king. So we don't really understand the rules, the regulations, the ins and outs of these daily lives that these people before him, the fishermen, the farmers, the people who walked in the marketplace, he, we don't quite get it. So if we look to modern parables, things that we can compare now, it helps us out a little bit. Let's go to Luke 14, 25 to 35. Benjamin, could you read that please? Luke 14, 25 through 35. A large, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must hate 
everyone else by comparison, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. Then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a far, he will send a delegation to discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. If we compare what we're going through. Compare, it says, you must hate your family compared to how much you love God. He's not telling you to hate your family. He's saying your love for Him must be so intense that you have Him first and foremost, and then through that love we learn to love others. But if we don't have that deep an affection... That deep of a connection to God, it's not going to count. It doesn't make it. It won't last because when trials and tribulations come, or God forbid when we lose a family member, we won't be able to stand up knowing that we've paid the cost. He says count the cost. And then he gives these two examples of people who don't count the cost or are counting the cost so they understand they won't fail. Well, let's go to Luke 9, 23 through 25. Because back there he says, and if you in 27 he says, if you don't carry my cross, carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Well, this is just him saying it again in a different way. Luke 9, 23 through 25. Laura, could you read that, please? <clears throat> then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what you do, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? We must follow him wholeheartedly, give up our selfish ways, pick up our cross, deny ourselves. That is the cost. Are we counting that cost? Do we understand that he's expecting us to be salty, to have this seasoning in our lives within ourselves first before we worry about spreading it to others? And if you don't have enough to share, then don't try to give away what you got. Go back to him to get more. Go back to him to get more understanding, more love, more patience, more knowledge, more forgiveness. Go back to him so you're not the salty that the, the world says... That bitter because you didn't get the promotion. That bitter because you got overlooked. Bitter because your girlfriend said the wrong thing. Your husband said the wrong thing. Bitter because somebody cut you off. Yeah, all those things are not fun. But we're not called to have a life of fun. We're called to have a life of meaning and purpose in God. Called to have a life where His joy is more important than our happiness. And His joy comes to us through His love and through His kindness towards us. So that we can be that same way towards others. So that we can be gracious to them when we don't feel like being gracious. That we can be kind to them when we don't feel like being kind. We have to compare what we're going through to what Christ went through. Because he doesn't call us to do anything he didn't do. And he says, if they, he hated me first, of course they're going to hate you. If you're trying to be like me, if you're trying to be a Christian, allow me to disciple you, to groom you, just like they hated all the disciples, they're going to hate you. So you're going to have family members, you're going to have used-to-be friends, you're going to have co-workers, you're going to have the world which is looking at you through these embittered eyes that cause you narrow-minded, that cause you weird. But that's what we're called to be. We're called to be different. We're called to be a seasoning that stands out. Salt is unlike any other seasoning to me. I, can, I know salt. I might not know 
some of the other ones. But I know when somebody's put salt in something or when they have it. Nothing like going to McDonald's and getting some fries without salt on them. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, that's a waste of my time. I don't want some grease-covered potato sticks. I need to salt on them for the flavor, for the seasoning. Mm -hmm. It brings something out. So if we're the right type of salt, we can bring that out not only in ourselves, but in others. Amen. Just like the fruit of the Spirit, it's meant to be shared, this salt that we're called to be. When I pray with my wife a lot of times, I pray for my children to be the salt and the light mm -hmm. of the earth. Mm -hmm. Because I know that's what we're trying to teach them, what we've been trying to teach them. And not that they copy me or Nicole, but that they get in this word and learn how to be that for themselves and for their God, mm -hmm. for Jesus. Because Jesus saved them, not Ben or Nicole Underwood, not Dolores. Mm -hmm. We may have shown them a way. We may have given them put a Bible in their hand, taken them to, to Bible study, given them a Bible class while they were in high school, but that doesn't save them. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, like we speak of during communion, like we remember on Good Friday, when we remember on Resurrection Sunday, that is what saved them. And their belief in Him, their faith in Him, their relationship with Him is what keeps them saved. And the same thing goes for anyone here in my voice that makes that choice, that makes that connection and has that relationship. But what's important in that, and I can't, I don't like to talk about it. I really don't. I know I talk about it quite a bit, but I don't like to talk about it. But let's, Kirk, if you could go back to verses 33, 34, and 35 of Luke 14. Actually, just do 34, 35 for me. Luke 14, 34, and 35. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavor of the salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pot. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So, you know, he, he says it kind of mild here. But flavorless salt is thrown away. It's not going to be used in any way, shape, or form. Not in the manure pile or in the soil. So, it's just useless. So if we can't be who God has called us to be, not what we think or reason in our own understanding of what God has called us to be, because sometimes that is kind of far off from what we're expected to be. We, 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 we think we know. But have we really done what Romans 12 says? Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that he has to change our mind. So then we will know His perfect and pleasing will for us. So if you're confused about your purpose in God, who you're called to be, the direction you're supposed to go, what you're supposed to do with your personal life, your professional life, your spiritual life, go to God. Go to Romans 12, 1 and 2. You have to go to God to get God answers. You can come to me and we can talk about it. You can go to Nicole and she can pray about it. You can go to Dolores and she can do both. Whatever. But the answers only come from God. The, the man of God in the Bible, when he was talking about, well, how did you, what did you interpret? Well, I didn't interpret it. The dream. God did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I didn't do this. The power that a disciple wields isn't his own power. It's the power of God. So when you speak over someone and if you're given the gift of healing, that healing doesn't come from you. Yeah, you may pray, you may lay hands, you may anoint with oil, but the power behind it, no different than an electrical plug carries a current from the electric company that is generated and shoved through the power lines all the way to your house up until it lights a light bulb. It doesn't come from the cord. It doesn't even come from the lamp. The power behind it is, is so far removed, we have to, you, you understand where it comes from because you pay the bill. You turn on the switch, you, you, you flip the knob. But we often forget that the same thing applies with God. When we connect to God and pray and turn on that switch in prayer and in faith, it's His power that flows through us. And yes, that's a mighty thing, it's a wonderful thing. It is a God-breathed thing because we're called to do greater works than these. 
that Jesus said. He said, if you are my disciples and if you believe and if you pray and you receive what I'm doing for you, you will do greater works than these. Thank you. <clears throat> but, again, unfortunately, it says, flavorless salt is neither good for the soil nor the manure pile. It is thrown away. And what does that mean, comparing it? Somehow help. If we can't, first of all, be salty for ourselves, connecting to Him, staying flavored and gracious, I hate to say it like this, but almost forgiving God when we have to go through things. Because we want to blame God, so if we're blaming God, we really need to forgive Him when we go through things. But that's not even real. That's just a way that I'm trying to explain it to you. Because He allows us to go through these things for our good. It doesn't feel like it, doesn't seem like it, the book of James tells us though. Book of James chapter 1. That we go through these things, it's good for you because it tests your faith. And when your faith is tested, it will grow. And then you will become mature and lack nothing. It's another thing you need to do if you're not sure about your purpose. If your faith isn't strong enough. To face these trials head on. With God by your side, not run from them, not turn your back to them. Not ignore them, but go into them with God. Allow your faith to grow. Allow it to manifest in such a way that it changes you. Because you don't want to be thrown away. I know I don't. There's a purpose to this relationship with God. It's so we don't end up in that place where he said, it's better to be going to heaven with one eye than to be thrown into hell where the maggots never die. And the fire never goes out. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about throwing away. If we lose that saltiness, if we lose that preservation that God gives us to protect us, to keep us seasoned, to keep us gracious, to keep us kind, because if we're not gracious with others, what? We become angry. That anger can lead to sin, and that sin can lead to death. Again, the book of James. So family, my question to you again is, are you salty? I hope so. If you're not, get salty. Amen. Go to God and say, God, help me to be salty. Help me to be that salt and that light. Amen? Amen. Nicole, could you pray for Amen. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity and time, Father, to come before you, Lord God. Father, are we salty, Father? Do we have what is in us, Father, to draw people unto you, Father? What are we doing with what you have put in our hands, Father? What are we doing, Father, with our purpose that you have given to us? Are we trying to serve our purpose, our needs? Do we have a hidden agenda? Are we serving the enemy or are we serving you? We cannot have two masters, only one. You said, Father, as a man of God said earlier, you said in your word, Father, here yeah, I wish you were hot or cold, not lukewarm. So, Father, are we walking out lukewarm, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father? Are we walking out hot, fierce, on fire, or passion for you, or Father? Are we just lifeless, or we are dead? We're not bearing any fruit of you. Let us really introspect and check ourselves daily, Lord. What is blocking, stopping us, causing us, Lord, forgive me to say, spiritually constipating us, Lord God, that we can put out, Father, what you have put in us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord, that we look more like Christ. Help us, Lord, that we sound more like Christ. Help us, Father, that we flow in your spirit, in your will, in your way. And, Father, this work week that is ahead of us, Lord God, is going to have its ups and its downs, its, its temptations and its trials. But, God, you are for us and you are not against us. You are walking with us, Father. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. And we thank you for being a wonderful counselor and our all in all. So, Father, again, we thank you for this word that has come forth, Father, with boldness. Father, let us be those spirits, those, those Christians, Father, operating in your spirit of flavor, Lord, in Jesus' name. Not being so spooky spiritual and acting like we all that and pious and hypocritical, but, Father, acting as Christ would act today. Father, walking in compassion, walking in love, but walking in obedience, not timidity, Father, or fear, but, Father, walking in meekness and boldness for your word, speaking, Father, your power, operating in your power. 
and doing it all for you. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We pray over the weather reports that are coming forth. Father God, that you would, would be protect us, Lord God. We pray traveling mercies for each and every one of us. And we just say thank you for covering us, our families, even our material possessions and ideas. Father, we love you. We are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.